Good evening, my friends. Welcome back to Read Aloud. Let's read something together. So, uh, it's our second time back after our long, wintry hiatus. And we started last week on Dot and the Kangaroo by Ethel Pedley. And uh, it was a fairly short chapter. Dot has been lost in the outback and has happened upon a kangaroo who has offered to give her a ride in her pouch and help her find her way home. I'm using uh, uh, she and her a lot. So the kangaroo is giving Dot a ride in the kangaroo's pouch. And at the end of the chapter, as they were hopping along, uh, Dot sang a, a little and very uh, rhythmically correct and enjoyable to read aloud song. And that is where the chapter ended. And so we are ready to begin chapter two in Dot and the Kangaroo. Again, I am reading off of the computer screen, so I apologize for almost looking at you and doing the back and forth thing with the eyes. So let's begin chapter two. That is a nice song of yours, said the Kangaroo. And I like it very much, but please stop singing now as we are getting near the water hole, for it's not etiquette to make a noise near water at sundown. Dot would have asked why everything must be so quiet, but as she peeped out, she saw that the kangaroo was making a very dangerous decision, and she did not like to trouble her friend with questions just then. They seemed to be going down to a great deep gully that looked almost like a hole in the earth. The depth was so great, and the hills around came so closely together. The way the kangaroo was hopping was like going down the side of a wall. Huge rocks were tumbling about here and there. Some looked as if they would come rolling down upon them, and others appeared as if a little jolt would send them crashing and tumbling into the darkness below. Where the kangaroo found room to land on its feet after each bound puzzled Dot, for there seemed no foothold anywhere. It all looked so dangerous to the little girl that she shut her eyes so as not to see the terrible places they bounded over or rested on. She felt sure that the kangaroo must lose her balance or hop just a little too far or a little too near and that they would fall together over the side of that terrible wild cliff. At last she said, Oh, kangaroo, shall we get safely to the bottom, do you think? I never think, said the kangaroo, but I know we shall. This is the easiest way. If I went through the thick bush on the other side, I should stand a chance of running my head against a tree at every leap. Unless I got a stiff neck with holding my head on one side looking out of one eye all the time. My nose gets in the way when I look straight in front, she explained. Don't be afraid, she continued. I know every jump of the way. We kangaroos have gone this way ever since Australia began to have kangaroos. Look here, she said, pausing on a big boulder that hung right over the gully. We have made a history book for ourselves out of these rocks, and so long as these rocks last, long, long after the time when there will be no more kangaroos and no more humans, the sun and the moon and the stars will look down upon what we have traced on these stones. Dot peered out from her little refuge in the kangaroo's pouch, and saw the glow of the twilight sky reflected on the top of the boulder. The rough surface of the stone shone with a beautiful polish like a looking glass, for the rock had been rubbed for thousands of years by the soft feet and tails of millions of kangaroos, kangaroos that had hopped down that way to get water. When Dot saw that, she didn't know why it all seemed solemn, or why she felt such a very little girl. She was a little sad, for the kangaroo, after a short sigh, continued on her way. As they neared the bottom of the gully, the kangaroo became extremely cautious. She no longer hopped in the open, but made her way with little leaps through the thick scrub. She peeped out carefully before each movement. Her long, soft ears kept moving to catch every sound, and her black, sensitive little nose was constantly lifted, sniffing the air. Every now and then she gave little backward starts, as if she were going to retreat by the way she had come, and Dot, with her face pressed against the kangaroo's soft, furry coat, 
could hear her heart beating so fast that she knew she was very frightened. They were not alone. Dot could hear whispers from unseen little creatures everywhere in the scrub and from birds in the trees. High up in the branches were numbers of pigeons, sweet little bronze wings, and above all the other sounds she could hear their plaintive voices crying, We're so frightened, we're so frightened, so thirsty and so frightened, so thirsty and so frightened. Why don't they drink at the water hole, whispered Dot. Because they're frightened, was the answer. Frightened of what? asked Dot. Humans, said the kangaroo, in frightened tones. And as she spoke, she reared up on her long legs and tail, so that she stood at least six feet high, and peeped over the bushes, her nose working all round, and her ears wagging. I think it's safe, she said, as she squatted down again. Friend kangaroo, said a bronze wing that had sidled out to the end of a neighboring branch, you are so courageous. Will you go first to the water and let us know if it is all safe? We haven't tasted a drop of water for two days, she said sadly, and we're dying of thirst. Last night when we had waited for hours to make certain there were no cruel humans about, we flew down for a drink and we wanted, oh, so little, just three little sips, but that the terrible humans with their bang-bangs murdered numbers of us. Then we flew back, and some were hurt and bleeding and died of their wounds, and none of us have dared to get a drink since. Dot could see that the poor pigeon was suffering great thirst, for its wings were drooping, and its poor dry beak was open. The kangaroo was very distressed at hearing the pigeon's story. It's dreadful for you pigeons, she said, not, or because you can only drink at evening. We sometimes can quench our thirst in the day. I wish we could do without water. The humans know all the water holes, and sooner or later we all get murdered or die of thirst. How cruel they are. Still the pigeons cried on, We're so thirsty and so frightened. And the bronze wing asked the kangaroo to try again if she could either smell or hear a human near the water hole. I think we are safe, said the kangaroo, having sniffed and listened as before. I will now try a nearer view. The news soon spread that the kangaroo was going to venture near the water to see if all was safe. The light was very dim, and there was a general whisper that the attempt to get a drink of water should not be left later, as some feared such foes as dingoes and night birds should they venture into the open space at night. As the kangaroo moved stealthily forward, pushing aside the branches of the scrub, or standing erect to peep here and there, there was absolute silence in the bush. Even the pigeons ceased to say they were afraid, but hopped silently from bough to bough, following the movements of the kangaroo with eager little eyes. The brush turkey and the mound builder left their heaped-up nests and joined the other thirsty creatures, and only by the crackling of the dry scrub or the, the falling of a few leaves could one tell that so many live creatures were together in that wild place. Presently the kangaroo had reached the last bushes of the scrub, behind which she crouched. There's not a smell or sound, she said. Get out, Dot, and wait here until I return, and the bronze wings have had their drink, for did they see you, they would be too frightened to come down, and would have to wait another night and day. Dot got out of the pouch, and she was very sorry when she saw how terrified her friend looked. She could see the fur on the kangaroo's chest moving with the frightened beating of her heart, and her beautiful brown eyes looked wild and strange with fear. Instantly, the kangaroo leaped into the open. For a second, she paused erect, sniffing and listening, and then she hastened to the water. As she stooped to drink, Dot heard a whir, 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 and like falling leaves, down swept the bronze wings. It was a wonderful sight. The water hole shone in the dim light with the great black darkness of the trees surrounding it, and from all parts came the thirsty creatures of the bush. The bronze wings were all together. Hundreds of little heads bobbed by the edge of the pool as the little bills were filled and the precious water was swallowed. Then, together, a minute afterwards, whirr, 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 up they flew, and in one great sweeping circle they regained their treetops. 
like the bush creatures, Dot was also frightened, and running to the water, hurriedly drank and fled back to the shelter of the bush, where the kangaroo was waiting for her. Jump in, said the kangaroo, it's never safe by the water, and a minute after, Dot was again in the cozy pouch, and was hurrying away, like all the others from the water, where men are wont to camp, and kill with their guns the poor creatures that come to drink. That evening, the kangaroo tried to persuade Dot to eat some grass, but as Dot said she had never eaten grass, it got some roots from a friendly bandicoot, which the little girl ate because she was hungry, but she thought she wouldn't like to be a bandicoot always to eat such food. Then in a nice dry cave, she nestled into the fur of the gentle kangaroo and was so tired that she slept immediately. She only woke up once. She had been dreaming that she was at home and was playing with the new little calf that had come the day before she was lost, and she couldn't remember at first waking what had happened or where she was. It was dark in the cave, and outside the bushes and trees looked quite black, for there was but little light in that place from the starry sky. It seemed terribly lonesome and wild. When the kangaroo spoke, she remembered everything, and they both sat up and talked a little. Mopo, Mopo, sang the night jar in the distance. I wish the night jar wouldn't make that noise when one wants to sleep, said the kangaroo. It hasn't got any voice to speak of, and the tune is stupid. It gives me the jim jams, for it reminds me I've lost my baby kangaroo. There is something wrong about birds that think themselves musical, she continued. They are well behaved and considerate enough in the day, but as soon as it is a nice, quiet, calm night, or a bit of a moon in the sky, they make night hideous to everyone with an earshot. Mohopoke, mohopoke, oh, it gives me the blues. As the kangaroo spoke, she hopped to the front of the cave. I say, night jar, she said, I'm a little sad tonight. Please go and sing elsewhere. Ah, said the night jar, I'm so glad I've given you deliciously dismal thoughts with my song. I'm a great artist and can touch all hearts. That is my mission in the world when all the bush is quiet and everyone has time to be miserable. I make them more so. Isn't it lovely to be like that? I'd rather you sang something cheerful, said the kangaroo to herself, but out loud she said, I find it really too beautiful. It is more than I can bear. Please go a little further off. Mopo. Mopo croaked the night jar further and further in the distance as it flew away. What a pity, said the kangaroo as she returned to the cave. The possum made that unlucky joke of telling the night jar it has a touching voice and can sing. Everyone has to suffer for that joke of the possum's. It doesn't matter to him, for he is awake all night, but it is too bad for his neighbors who want to sleep. Just then there arose from the bush a shrill wailing and shrieking that made Dot's heart stop with fear. It sounded terrible, as if something was wailing in great pain and suffering. Oh, kangaroo, she cried, what is the matter? That, said the kangaroo, as she laid herself down to rest, is the sound of the curlew enjoying itself. They are sociable birds and entertain a great deal. There is a party tonight, I suppose, and that is the expression of their enjoyment. I believe, she continued with a suppressed yawn, it's not so painful as it sounds. Willie Wagtail, who goes a great deal amongst humans, says they do that sort of thing also. He has often heard them when he lived near the town. Dot had never been in the town, but she was certain she had never heard anything like the curlews wailing in her home and she wondered what Willy Wagtail meant. But she was too sleepy to ask, so she nestled a little closer to the kangaroo, and with the shrieking of the curlews and the mournful note of the distant mopoke in her ears, she fell asleep again. Chapter 3. Go ahead and read Chapter 3. When Dot awoke, she did so with a start of fear, Something in her sleep had seemed to tell her that she was in danger. At a first glance, she saw that the kangaroo had left her, and coiled upon her body was a young black snake. 
Before Dot could move, she heard a voice from a tree outside the cave say very softly, Don't be afraid. Keep quite still, and you will not get hurt. Presently I'll kill that snake. If I tried to do so now, it might bite you, so I let it sleep on. She looked up in the direction of the tree and saw a big kookaburra perched on a bough with all the creamy feathers of its breast fluffed out and its crest very high. The kookaburra is one of the jolliest birds in the bush and is always cracking jokes and laughing, but this one was keeping as quiet as he could. Still, he could not be quite serious, and a smile played all round his huge beak. Dot could see that he was nearly bursting with suppressed laughter. He kept on saying under his breath, What a joke this is! What a capital joke! How they'll all laugh when I tell them! Just as if it was the funniest thing in the world to have a snake coiled up on one's body, when the horrid thing might bite with its poisonous fangs at any moment, Dot said she didn't see any joke, and it was no laughing manner. matter. To be sure, you don't see the joke, said the jovial bird. Onlookers always see the jokes, and I'm an onlooker. It's not to be expected of you, because you're not an onlooker. And he shook with suppressed laughter again. Where is my dear kangaroo? asked Dot. She has gone to get you some berries for breakfast, said the kookaburra, and she asked me to look after you, and that's why I'm here. That snake got on you whilst I flew away to consult my doctor, the white owl, about the terrible indigestion I have. He's very difficult to catch awake, for he's out all night and sleepy all day. He says cockchafers have caused it. The horny wing cases and legs are most indigestible, he assures me. I didn't fancy them that much when I ate them last night, so I took his advice and coughed them up, and I'm no longer feeling depressed. Take my advice and don't eat cockchafers, little human." Dot did not really hear all this, nor heed the excellent advice of the kookaburra not to eat those hard green beetles that had disagreed with it, for a shivering movement had gone through the snake, and presently all the scales of its shining black back and rosy underpart began to move. Dot felt quite sick as she saw the reptile begin to uncoil itself as it lay upon her. She hardly dared to breathe, but lay as still as if she were dead, so as not to frighten or anger the horrid creature, which presently seemed to slip like a slimy cord over her bare legs, and wriggled away to the entrance of the cave. With a quick, delighted movement, she sat up, eager to see where the deadly snake would go. It was very drowsy, having slept heavily on Dot's warm little body, so it went slowly towards the bush to get some frogs or birds for breakfast. But as it wriggled into the warm morning sunlight outside, Dot saw a sight that made her clap her hands together with anxiety for the life of the jolly kookaburra. No sooner did the black snake get outside the cave than she saw the kookaburra fall like a stone from its branch right on top of the snake. For a second, Dot thought the bird must have tumbled down dead. It was such a sudden fall. But a moment later, she saw it flutter on the ground in battle with the poisonous reptile, whilst the snake wriggled and coiled its body into hoops and rings, the kookaburra's strong wings beating the air just above the writhing snake made a great noise, and the serpent hissed in its fierce hatred and anger. Then Dot saw that the kookaburra had firm hold of the snake by the back of its neck, and that it was vainly trying to fly upwards with its enemy. In vain the dreadful creature tried to bite the gallant bird. In vain it hissed and stuck out its wicked little spiky tongue. In vain it tried to coil itself round the bird's body. The kookaburra was too strong and too clever to lose its hold, or to let the snake get power over it. At last Dot saw that the snake was getting weaker and weaker, for little by little the kookaburra was able to rise higher with it until it reached the high bough. All the time the snake was held in the bird's beak, writhing and coiling in agony, for he knew that the kookaburra had won the battle. But when the noble bird had reached its perch, it did a strange thing— for it dropped the snake right down to the ground. Then it flew down again and brought the snake re or brought the reptile back to the bow and dropped it once more. And this it did many times. Each time the snake moved less and less, for its back was being broken by these falls. 
At last, the kookaburra flew up with its victim for the last time, and holding it on the branch with its foot, this beat the serpent's head with its great strong beak. Dot could hear the blows fall, whack, 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 as the beak smote the snake's head, first on one side, then on the other, until it lay limp and dead across the bow. Ha, 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 laughed the kookaburra and said to Dot, Did you see all that? Wasn't it a joke? What a capital joke. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, ho, ho, how my sides do ache. What a joke. How they'll laugh when I tell them. Then came a great flight of kookaburras, for they had heard the laughter and all wanted to know what the joke was. Proudly, the kookaburra told them all about the snake sleeping on Dot and the great fight. All the time, first one kookaburra, then another, chuckled over the story, and when it came to an end, every bird dropped its wings, cocked up its tail, and throwing back its head, opened its great beak, and all laughed uproariously together. Dot was nearly deafened by the noise, for some chuckled, some cackled, some said, ha, 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 others said, oh, ho oh, oh, and as soon as one left off, another began, until it seemed as though they couldn't stop. They all said it was a splendid joke, and that they really must go and tell it to the whole bush. So they flew away, and far and near for hours the bush echoed with chuckling and cackling, and wild bursts of laughter as the kookaburras told that grand joke everywhere. Now, said the kookaburra, when all the others had gone, a bit of snake is just the right thing for breakfast. Will you have some, little human? Dot shuddered at the idea of eating snake for breakfast, and the kookaburra thought she was afraid of being poisoned. It won't hurt you, he said kindly. I took care that it did not bite itself. Sometimes they do that when they are dying, and then they're not good to eat. But this snake is all right, and won't disagree like cockchafers. The scales are quite soft and digestible, he added. But Dot said she would rather wait for the berries the kangaroo was bringing, so the kookaburra remarked that if she would excuse it, he would like to begin breakfast at once, as the fight had made him hungry. Then Dot saw him hold the reptile on the branch with his foot whilst he took its tail into his beak and proceeded to swallow it in a very leisurely way. In fact, the kookaburra was so slow that very little of the snake had disappeared when the kangaroo returned. The kangaroo had brought a pouch full of berries and, in her hand, a small spray of the magic ones, by eating which Dot was able to understand the talk of all the bush creatures. All the time she was wandering in the bush, the kangaroo gave her some of those to eat daily, and Dot soon found that the effect of these strange berries only lasted until the next day. The kangaroo emptied out her pouch, and Dot found quite a large collection of roots, buds, and berries, which she ate with good appetite. The kangaroo watched her eating with a look of quiet satisfaction. See, she said, how easily one can live in the bush without hurting anyone, and yet humans live by murdering creatures and devouring them. If they are lost in the scrub, they die, because they know no other way to live than that cruel one of destroying us all. Humans have become so cruel that they kill and kill, not even for food, but for the love of murdering. I often wonder, she said, why they and the dingoes are allowed to live on this beautiful kind earth. The aboriginal humans kill and devour us, but they even are not so terrible as the whites, who delight in taking our lives and torturing us just as an amusement. Every creature in the bush weeps that they should have come to take the beautiful bush away from us. Dot saw that the sad brown eyes of the kangaroo were full of tears, and she cried too as the thought of all the poor animals and birds suffering at the hands of white men. Dear kangaroo, she said, if I ever get home, I'll tell everyone of how you unhappy creatures live in fear and suffer and ask them not to kill you poor things any more. But the kangaroo sadly shook her head and said, Humans are cruel and love to murder. We must all die. But about your lost way, she continued in a brisk tone by way of changing this painful subject, I've been asking about it and no one has seen it anywhere. Of course, someone must know where it is, but the difficulty is to find the right one to ask. Then she dropped her voice and came a little nearer to Dot, and stooping down until her little black hands hung close to the ground, she whispered in Dot's ear, I say I ought to consult the platypus. Could the platypus help, do you think? Dot asked. 
I never think, said the kangaroo, but as the platypus never goes anywhere, never associates with any other creature, and is hardly ever seen, I conclude it knows everything. It must, you know. Of course, said Dot, with some doubt in her tone. The only thing is, continued the kangaroo, once more sitting up and pensively scratching her nose, the only thing is, I can't bear the platypus. The sight of it gives me the creeps. It's such a queer creature. I've never seen a platypus, said Dot. Do tell me what it is like. I couldn't describe it, said the kangaroo with a shudder. It seems made up of parts of two or three different sorts of creatures that none of us can account for it. It must have been an experiment when all the rest of us were made, or else it was made up of the odds and ends of the birds and beasts that were left over after we were all finished. Little Dot clapped her hands. Oh, dear kangaroo, she said, do take me to see the platypus. There was nothing like that in my Noah's Ark. I should say not, remarked the kangaroo. The animals in the Ark said that they were each to be of its kind, and every sort of be bird and beast refused to admit the platypus, because it was of so many kinds. And at last Noah turned it out to swim for itself, because there was such a row. That's why the platypus is so secluded. Ever since then, no platypus is friendly with any other creature, and no animal or bird is more than just polite to it. They couldn't be, you see, because of that trouble in the ark. But that was so long ago, said Dot, filled with compassion for the lonely platypus. And after all, this is not the same platypus, nor are all the bush creatures the same now as then. No, returned the kangaroo, and some say there was no ark and no fuss over the matter, but that, of course, doesn't make any difference, for it's a very ancient quarrel, so it must be kept up. But if we are, go, are to go to the platypus, we had better start now. It, it is a good time to see it. So come along, little Dot, said the kangaroo. And that is the end of chapter three, and we'll stop there. And the next time we will read chapter four. So, okay, um, I don't know what your thoughts were regarding those two chapters. Um, I'm beginning to get a feel for uh, Pedley's writing style a little bit, and um, let, let me give you just my, my quick thoughts. One, I really like the kangaroo. I, I really enjoy the kangaroo's way of, I never think, and that's beside the point. Um, I thought that was good. I'm, I'm enjoying that rhythm of those conversations. Um, I'm definitely, um, I say this as one of the most ardent environmentalists that you will find on Facebook Live at this time of evening. Um, I felt that the stuff about the humans was a little sanctimonious. It, uh, it, it kind of reminded me of, um, if you've ever read The Jungle by Upton Sinclair, a lot of The Jungle, I think, is really not terribly written, but there are large stretches where you're like, this is not a book, this is a political tract. This is not uh, fiction, this is a treatise of some kind. And there were times when I, I could definitely tell that the uh, the theme was leading the story more than the other way around. Um, so we'll see if that tone continues, if, uh, you know, we get into more authentic sounding dialogue later, or not, I don't know. Um, the other thing was um, that whole bit about the kookaburra uh, killing and eating the black snake. That was that was that was kind of a deal, wasn't it? That was um, yeah. I, I I was kind of keeping an eye on the number of people watching live. If you're one of the two people watching live right now, by the way, hi and thank you. Um, I think I had four people on when the snake thing started, and then I dropped down to two or three. So. Um, if if that was just a little too raw and real, then um, that's that's understandable. I um, yeah, I. That's all I have to say about that. I, if you stuck with me, thank you, and uh, as ever, I appreciate your your time. Thanks for thanks for coming, and thanks for listening to the story. Um. This is definitely kind of an uneven manuscript, but I'm really enjoying the the story so far. It's um uh, again, it's a voice 
and a perspective and of a subject matter. It, it, it's unlike anything I've read uh, before, which is cool. So um, that's it for now. It's getting kind of late. I think I'm going to maybe eat a bowl of oatmeal and like start writing my assignments down in my uh, academic planner for the coming semester. It's going to be fun. So um, whether you're watching this live right now or watching this later at some other time, thank you for joining me. I will uh, see you again later in the week or Sunday night or whenever I normally do this. Uh, I'm grateful for your support. So stay healthy out there. Wear a mask. Wear two masks. Uh, do what you can. Be safe out there. Um, I'm grateful for you. I love you. Tell the people that you love that you love them. And have a good night. And I will see you later. Think. The kangaroo doesn't think, but I think you should think. And I forgot to say this last time. Remember that nothing is boring except to people who aren't paying attention. <laughs>